Uh, welcome to Simon Winchester, who has uh, joined us today for an uh, interview to cover his most recent book, Land, How the Hunger for Ownership Shaped the Modern World. Uh, we are Earth.org. We are a not-for-profit environmental organization based in Hong Kong. And our aim is to bring attention to what is happening to natural ecosystems worldwide. We advocate for sustainable economic policies, for the protection of the national, natural environment, and the extension of governments or overnight oversight to cover the global commons. With Earth.org talks and interviews like these, we try to engage with inspiring change makers and thought leaders to share their opinion and knowledge with our global audience, all to bring attention to what we humans are doing to our planet. Now, I would like to welcome Simon Winchester, who is a New York Times bestselling author with such titles as The Professor and the Madman, The Map That Changed the World, the man who loved China, and most recently, land. In 2006, he was awarded an Order of the British Empire for his services to journalism and literature. And although he hails from England, he currently splits his time between New York City and Massachusetts, I believe, uh, where he owns 123 acres of land. Interestingly. So thank you, Simon, for joining us. It's a great pleasure. And I used to live in Hong Kong for 13 years, so it's rather good oh, to be great. back, as it were. Yes. <laughs> Great. Um, so to start off, I'll switch to. So to start off the interview, uh, I kind of wanted to ask, you know, as we just mentioned, you open your book saying that you own these 123 acres of land in the U.S. and, as you call it, a piece of the United States of America. Um, so kind of just what is it like to own a piece of land, and how does this figure into your decision to write this book? I had never owned any land. I don't think anywhere that I lived, certainly not in Hong Kong, as you well know how incredibly expensive it is. Um, mm -hmm. But when I came back from my years in Hong Kong and moved to New York City, um, I bought a little cottage about 100 miles north of the city and um, in a fairly remote location. I mean, when I lived in Hong Kong, I lived way out in the New Territories. I like solitude, which I think is, I, mean, I have an off, had an office in downtown Hong Kong, but I preferred to go home to the countryside. And um, so it so happened that the chap who we would hunt on the land around where my little cottage was in upstate New York, not in Massachusetts, it's, I still own it, but it's about 50 miles away okay. from where I live now. He said he was tired of paying the taxes and uh, he wondered whether I'd like to increase my holdings. I think then I just owned the house and a couple of acres by a big chunk. And I thought, well, why not? And uh, it was pretty useless land. Um, it was on the side of a, a mountain. It was quite beautiful, it had little streams and a lot of trees and uh, animals and so forth. Um, so I bought it for a fairly small amount of money and I never really thought much of it. But then uh, when I became an American citizen, which was in 2011, I think, I suddenly, all of a sudden, it became significant. I was literally invested, I felt, in the United States and of the huge number of billions of acres of this country. I owned now a tiny fraction. And that meant something. So I went down and and sort of investigated it and I learned a lot about the flora and fauna and indeed the topography of the land. But more than that, I was interested in this, who had owned it before me and who had owned it before him and for him and for him. So I started to do some sort of very basic historical research. It's in Dutchess County, New York, and uh, the records are pretty well kept. So one went back through the years and the deed transfers were mostly typewritten until maybe the 1870s and then they started being handwritten and then as I went back into the 1780s and so forth were still findable the records were then more decrepit I mean they were old and moth-eaten but legible still and then the interesting thing was that when I got back to the early 17th century when the records were pretty spotty, but still there. They were no longer written in English. They were written in Dutch. And the people from whom these Dutch explorers, um, led oddly enough by an Englishman, Henry Hudson, 
I forget the name of the Hudson River and Hudson Bay, um, but he was working for the Dutch. Um, the, the transfers, there was no signatures from the people that, from whom Henry Hudson was acquiring the land. There were just X's or marks, little drawings of deer or sheep or some kind of plant or animal. And of course, these, I realized, were the Mexican Indians or Native Americans who people these parts. So I then began to think about and question some academics, well, what was their attitude towards ownership? And they said they were very perplexed. Why would anyone like these Dutchmen or later still English people wish to own the land? I mean, you could no more, someone not a Mohican, but a Native American who lives out or lived out the West Coast, said you can no more own the land than you can own the sea or the breeze. It's, it's common to everyone. So by all means, we'll accept money and you can be here if you like, just as we've been here for thousands of years, but you can't own it. But if that's what you think you can, well, get on with it. And so we have owned it, people like me, for the subsequent two, 200 years. And so I thought, that this idea of ownership, so alien to so many, not just Native Americans here, First Nation people in Canada, Aboriginals in Australia, Maori people in uh, New Zealand, to all of these people and to many, many more, particularly indigenous people, this concept of ownership was puzzling. It was a Western construct. And so I thought this would make for an interesting book. And, um, I put it to my editor in New York and she said, yes, I love the idea, um, but you can't restrict it simply to America. You've got to go worldwide. And so I wandered about, I mean, I don't know if you managed to get through the whole book, but I went to Ukraine and New Zealand and India and China and all over the place, looking at how the concept of ownership varies from place to place and how it played a part, mostly a very significant part, in the development of the societies that came along on the heels of the idea of ownership. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, um, I mean, it's, it's quite interesting that you take such a broad look at so many different places and how land ownership kind of changes depending on, you know, where you are geographically. You know, you look at the US, you, like you said, New Zealand, Ukraine, even Israel, Palestine. Um, why did you, how did you decide on which places to, to include in your book or which stories to include? I think because in all cases, all the countries I visited, there was one particular thread of a story which I found fascinating. Like I went to Latvia and that's because there are a series of long forgotten memorials in Latvia and in countries to the north and south of Latvia along a survey line that was drawn in the 19th century to determine the size of planet Earth. And the man who did it, a man called Struva, who was a Russian, or at least working for the Russians at the time, did it with astonishing accuracy. And I'm fascinated with maps and have a lot of them and collect them. And so the, the initial, the, the way I structured the book was that if you're going to own land, you've got to know where it is. You've got to know how big it is, how high it is, where its boundaries are. So the whole business of borders fascinates me and the whole business of topography and delineating that topography and putting it on paper fascinates me. And Latvia happened to be a place where I was able to find the original relics of the survey marks and so forth. Then again, I went to Ukraine on the same trip as it happens, it's just sort of down the road as it were. and. Um, that because of a totally different aspect of the land. And that was the wanton and cruel confiscation of the land by the Soviet government in the 1930s to create collectivized farms. And this resulted in one of the greatest genocides. I think it's not accepted by the Americans that it was a genocide, but it certainly isn't by the Canadians and a lot of other civilized countries that the Stalin committed genocide, which resulted in the deaths of between 10 and 20 million people who were starved to death in the way he managed the land there. And so each one of these countries I chose, not just sort of for bragging rights to say, I went to Lithuania, I went to 
sort of wherever India or Bengal or New Zealand, but because each one told a story which illustrated part of the overall story that I wanted to tell. I could have remained almost entirely in the United States, but I I think my editor was right to suggest I wandered about. But of course, interestingly, you couldn't do that book at the moment because of the pandemic. I mean, there's so many borders. The, the new book I'm doing, which is a completely different subject, I have a pressing need to go to Bangalore in South India. But at the moment, mm. I can't. I'm just champing at the bit. So, but this was relatively easy to do because it was written before pandemic. Mm, of course. Uh, were there any stories that missed out <laughs> on the final cut? Yes, there were actually. It's interesting you should say that because I always feel protective about particular stories. And there was one which nearly didn't make the cut, which is in the book, Kangol, because I fought uh, tooth and nail to keep that in. And that we can maybe talk about in a moment. And that was the, the creation of a piece of land that was never taken from anybody in Holland because it was created mm. out of the sea. It was lifted out of the sea. Mm -hmm. My editor said, ah, this is too technical, too boring. But I said, no, no, this is important. Now, the story that didn't make it all has to do with um, the law of trespass. Because I'm very interested in the way that trespass has become a crime, largely in this country. Whereas in countries with a sort of more mature attitude towards land, and I'm thinking of particularly Scandinavia, and now recently Scotland, and to a smaller extent, England, have this concept, which in Swedish is spoken as almond's right, which is all men's right, which is you may own land, but everyone, providing they behave themselves, has perfect right to walk across it and to enjoy it much as you might. So you can't throw people off your land just because you don't care for them or think that there are too many of them. And it all works out tremendously well. It's worked out in, in the Scandinavian countries for a long time. And now Scotland has just started it. And I did a long story um, about an estate, quite a large estate, 22,000 acres, but a farming estate, which is forests and uh, rivers. And so he farms sheep and cattle. And yes, he does allow some fishing for salmon on one of the rivers. Um, but uh, he now reluctantly, at first, had to agree with the changed rules by, brought about by the Scottish government that now everyone could walk across his land, land that he had thought was entirely private. And so we were out walking one day and we saw in the skyline people walking, walking with their dog on the moorland. And he said, five years ago, I could have taken my shotgun and asked them to leave. But now the law says, that they have the rights. And you know, he said, funnily enough, I, I entirely agree. Because, and he began to get the same view that the Native American in the West Coast had, which is, I own it, but it really belongs to everyone. And I thought, ah, oh, he's getting it. <laughs> but my editor <laughs> thought, that's a bit too much Scotland in this book. And so it turned out. Right. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's interesting that. Um... I mean, I guess we kind of, we, we grow up and we kind of think that that's how it's supposed to be, that we are all supposed to own, you know, a parcel of land and, and it's and it's our property. But but then, yes. right, you see these, uh, these freedom to roam uh, kind of um, plans and where it, it is a bit more, you know, less, uh, less restrictive. Um, and it kind of, um, you mentioned that the the idea of territories and the idea of, of boundaries kind of you know it fascinates you um and just considering how how bizarre this idea of land ownership has been for most of human history and for most peoples do you see you know like this this man in scotland do you see a, a world where you know territorial boundaries and borders kind of uh don't exist anymore or at least not in the same way well, not in this country anyway, by that I mean mm -hmm. America um, or the United States. Um, although there are signs that um, things are easing in the Northeast where I live. But I'm in Texas. I don't want to insult you. You may well be a proud Texan over there in Hong Kong. But I think the attitude, particularly in the 
in the Great Plains states and in the West generally has been, you know, this is my land and you better get off it. Because right. that is, I mean, I remember asking a lawyer the whole concept in America of uh, land owning. He said, well, it's all to do with the bundle of rights. And I said, explain. He said, well, there are five rights. You have the right to take the water, take the trees, take the minerals and so forth. But the number one right you have is the right of exclusion. You have an absolute right in law to throw anyone off your land that you wish. They have mm. no inherent right to be there. So right from the start, American law, and this is generally federal law, but it's applied in slight variations from state to state, says that um, you can't be here unless I give you permission. And that flies, in my view, totally in the face of um, what's fair and reasonable. I mean, my view is that yes, people should be able to superintend land. They can say they own it if you like, and they can, in a reasonable manner, um, say that they own it. But small amounts, relatively small amounts, I mean, Jefferson wanted a nation of yeoman farmers, and by that he meant no one really has need for more than 120 acres or so. And then John Locke, I mean, the English philosopher, took the view that, well, you can have less, let's say 40 acres, but so long as you improve it, and that's the key word, so long as you make, make it work for you, but preserve it, protect it, but improve it, then hang on to it. And that's why I think the, um, the Dutch story is important. Would you mind if I related the story of that? Because it's, it's in a way sort of ideal but it's unusual. Basically, as I'm sure you'll be aware, the Netherlands, the lowlands, lie almost entirely either at or a little below sea level. So they're constantly in danger of being inundated. So to protect them from the ravages of the North Sea, um, a man called Joseph Lely um, built in the 1920s, a huge dam, nearly 30 miles long, at the north end of the country to keep the sea, which previously flowed right into the middle of the country, to keep it at bay. Once he did that, once the dam held, and it has held ever since, so the water inside, which was called the Zuiderzee, the southern sea, ceased to be a sea and became fresh water. Took many years, but it eventually and it became what it is today, which is called the Isselmeer, no longer a sea, it's a mere, it's a lake. So you've got this gigantic lake in the middle of the Netherlands, and at the southern southwestern end, you've got Amsterdam. And people thought, well, we can reclaim the land from this shallow sea by doing some massive engineering projects. So to give you an example of the one I was interested in, which is called Flavoland, to the southern end of this big body of water. And they built an enormous series of walls or dams in the sea, creating a one million acre oblong. And they put huge pumps, gigantic pumps, which ran night and day for about 10 years. And slowly, 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 the water in this million acres of water lowered and lowered until you would see mud appearing. So now when you've got mud now, and but it's completely unstable and you can't do anything with it. So they flew aeroplanes back and forth over it, seeding it with reeds. And they then dropped flares and set it on fire. Must have been spectacular, a million acres deliberately burning. And this created ash and they planted from the air again, more reeds, and they did it five or six times until you've got a sort of six inch thickness of ash and then they flew back and forth over it with very hardy grass seeds, which then took root in this ash layer, ash and mud, and started creating soil. Soon, by the 1970s, this soil was firm enough for people to walk on and then eventually drive track laying vehicles and trucks. And so they sent to planning a new community a city 
called Lely Stanton, named after Lely, the man that had started this whole business. And they created a railway line and they created roads and a plan for a city, but still no people. But then in the 1980s, this crucial moment arrived where they said, all right, we, the government, the which is, remember, it's a monarchy in the Netherlands, um, have created a million acres of land. And now we're going to give it to people, rent it for a trivial amount of money, and to anyone who, who applies. You can have 60 acre, it was all done in hectares, of course, but let's say 60 acre plots. And anyone that takes it from us, and after 10 years shows that they have improved it, they can have it, they can own it. So they put big advertisements in the papers in Amsterdam and Rotterdam and The Hague and so forth. And they said, interestingly, that we're going to make the, sure that the demographic makeup of Flavoland, which is soon to become a new province of our country, has exactly the same demographic mixture as the rest of the country. So when you apply for this land, the successful applicants, when it's all worked out, 30% will be Roman Catholic, 30% will be Protestant, 30% will be a member of the Dutch Reformed Church, and 10% will be other. And so it came to pass. In the late 1980s, people started streaming in, and it's now it maybe as, it's as boring as Nebraska. It's flat, but prosperous, the people are happy, and they're just like the Dutchmen in the rest of the country, prosperous, mm -hmm. fat and happy, and are the cattle and the sheep that live there. <laughs> so it's been a great success and not a drop of blood was shed in the making of it. Yeah. They didn't steal it from anybody. No yeah. native peoples are angry. Now that's what should happen in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what's what's fascinating about that is, I mean, obviously that we, you know, can create land uh, pretty much out of nowhere, but also that mm, you can create this. There, there's always this idea that um, land is very, or a specific parcel of land is so closely tied to your identity as a as a nation or as a as a as a culture as a history. Um, but as you say, I mean, these uh, the these relocated. Dutchmen, they're they're quite they're quite happy, quite prosperous there, right? And they are. But I mean, it's very different from the, the other country in the world, of course, which has created a great deal of land is where you live in Hong Kong. And I remember the building of Chung Hong Kong Airport. I was there when it was a little fishing town, and I used <laughs> to go there. We used to go swimming there. I used to go fishing there with a couple of little villages, and then the government of Hong Kong said we're going to create new land all around it, hired Bechtel, this great privately owned San Francisco based construction company to build what is now Hong Kong International Airport. So the uses to which the land, the new land in Hong Kong has been put is much more commercial, mm -hmm. very little based on the individual. It's massive right. corporations who own you know, apartment blocks and shopping malls and things, which is, I think, a shame. I mean, I used to, as I mentioned earlier, I lived out in the New Territories, and you look at the land out in the Maipo Marshes to the west of Hong Kong, well, there you could create more land and use it for good purposes, which play into what Earth Org stands for. I think they did it in Holland. It could still be done in China. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Yeah, Hong Kong has been, obviously, I mean, as I'm speaking to you now on reclaimed land. <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm in the, the 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 Praia area in the Taiwan, and every every night I go to home on reclaimed land. So it's um it's something that it's it's become so kind of hard to separate, I guess, from the from the daily life in every way. Um, yeah, and probably no other city like it in the world. No, although uh, interestingly, and I don't want to stray too much from the topic. I was in Manhattan today, I still have a place there. Manhattan, of course, is a very geologically stable part of the world. As you know, when they build a new skyscraper, you bolt it deeply down into the schist and gneiss that is the bedrock, except for the reclaimed land in the southwest of Manhattan. And there, they, you know, they build a dam and they 
put lots of sand down there. And um, they created a huge now set of housing estates. Well, the irony is there that if there's ever a tremor, and there have been, there are some faults in New Jersey. So it's not unknown for, for Manhattan to be struck by earthquakes. All of the rest of Manhattan will be absolutely fine. But the sand in this part of southwestern Manhattan will liquefy and all the buildings will collapse. They never should have done it. It's what they did in, mm -hmm. in the Marina District in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So don't build skyscrapers. Do what the Dutch do. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's follow the Dutch's, the Dutch's lead. Um, so I wanted to ask uh, quickly about, um, you mentioned a few community land management or land ownership experiments. And, uh, you know, specifically the island of, of I don't want to pronounce this right, the, the island of Egg. Uh, Egg, and, yes, yes, yes. Just like and, Egg. Right. And, uh, and that brought to mind other kind of, you know, in, in the UK, obviously, there's, there's this whole, this fad of transition towns, right? These, um, these towns that are very kind of self-sustainable, self-sufficient, uh, uh, locally, pr locally produced goods kind of uh, take care of, of all the needs there. Um, as far as land tenure methods go, how effective are these, you know, kind of eco villages and self-sufficient communities as a, just as a technique? Well, to paraphrase Joan Lai's purported remark about the French Revolution, it's too early to tell what its effects are. So whatever happened on the Isle of Egg, whatever happened in uh, various other islands that have passed into community ownership, and indeed in England. I mean, it's, it looks promising, I must say. And Egg has certainly been, to an extent, a success. Um, I mean, it was ruled in a patrician kind of way where there was the laird of the island and he lived in a big castle and everyone on the island were his tenants and uh, there was a lot of doffing of caps and behavior which would seem terribly old fashioned and wrong today. Now, everyone owns the island. So they, you know, they have a sustainable electric generation plant. They've got a the sewage system is sustainable. Everyone pitches in to help with everything. And this has attracted a lot of people from outside Scotland, which is something that, first of all, when you go there, is a little jarring because you go to other islands in Scotland and everyone is Scottish. And if you go to the more remote islands, they probably don't speak much English. They speak the Gaelic, the, mm -hmm. the local Celtic language. But then you go to Egg and you find that they're, they're from Birmingham or Manchester or Liverpool. And one, so that upsets the, as with the demographic e ecosystem. Whether that's a good or a bad thing, I don't know. But in terms of managing the land and being more equitable and for egg becoming a, a pretty decent place to live. And particularly, of course, now we have the internet and all the sophistication of you can live anywhere. I think it is rather promising. I'm slightly, slightly more interested by the situation here in the States, particularly in the Northeast, where this brings me back to my little bit of land and just to sort of salve my conscience, if you like. I don't want you to think I'm some big land baron, I'm anything but. But I own the 123 acres down in uh, Dutchess County, New York, and where I am now is a farm. I don't have many animals, but I've got geese and chickens and things like that. And I've got 75 acres here. But all of it I'm giving away to the local land trust which will means that I divest myself of it. I sort of still have a responsibility to pay taxes, but it ensures that in perpetuity, there'll be no development ever and people can access it forever. So mm -hmm. I feel I'm doing something relatively good. Plus I'm sort of looking after the forests. Most of it is forest land. And so I think Insofar as you know, forests are hugely important for creating oxygen, all those good things. Um, I think looking after forests is a good thing. So I think in a small way, I'm doing something moderately responsible. And um, I think New England, where these land trusts are expanding in number, is bucking the trend and showing a way forward, which 
so far the Texans and people in Wyoming and Montana have not come to accept. So I'm hoping right. that this infection, if you like, will spread westwards. Right. You you did um, praise, I remember, uh, you know, like um, uh, Ted Turner for uh, kind yeah. of his, the way he's kind of uh, managed his land and or used it uh, for the, his own kind of the conservation efforts. Um, yes. Do you see that becoming kind of a more, I, maybe you could briefly explain what he's doing, uh, but uh, also do you see that becoming a more common kind of... Uh, well, I, I, I look in some detail at four big landowners around the world, mm -hmm. Ted Turner and John Malone, both, as it happens, television executives, um, who own almost exactly two million acres each. There's a bit of chest bumping to see who can become the bigger of the two landowners. Most of Ted Turner's are in the West. Most of John Malone's, as of some recent purchases, are in the Northeast, up here in Maine and on the Canadian border. Um, Ted Turner has made a big effort to preserve certain animals, most notably uh, the bison, uh, the buffalo. Um, the buffalo, as you may or may not know, was essentially wiped out for sport in the 19th century by white settlers who thought, let's kill the buffalo because they are the primary fo food source of the Plains Indians. So if we cut off their food source, then they'll all die. Mm -hmm. It sort of happened. I mean, it was, it was a genocide in and of itself. So Turner has sort of reversed that trend. I mean, he's no saint, but I applaud him for that. And there are other animals, tortoises and things, that he's done good things to. Malone is a, some, a different animal. He's a much more sort of hedonistic sort of fellow. He's fascinated by horse breeding. He has a lot of territory in Ireland where he does that. And harvesting in a questionably um, sustainable way, much of his big forests here in, in Maine and New Hampshire. So we're not 100% certain about uh, Malone. The other two big landowners are the biggest in the world, which is a woman called Gina Reinhardt, who owns 39 million acres, which is eight times the size of Israel, which is twice, I think, the size of England. And it's mainly, you. it's most in Australia, and it's extractive industries. I mean, she just acquires as much land as she can um, and tears it to bits gets the coal or the iron ore or whatever for, you know, she, it's her ownership, which has led or did lead some years ago to Australia just being regarded as a gigantic quarry for the mm. Japanese and other Chinese economies. So black marks, I'd say to her, but the blackest of all marks to me are a couple of Americans called the Wilkes brothers who come from far west Texas are, and I don't want to get too political about this, but are, or were avid supporters of the former president, are seriously evangelical members of a very bizarre right-wing Protestant church, mm. but who invented, it's hardly a laudable thing to invent, um, a particular kind of liquid for aiding in fracking industries and made an awful lot of money fracking. I'm, I'm totally opposed to fracking, but you know, they're, part of, they're part of that industry. Well, about 10 years ago, the Singapore Sovereign Wealth Fund decided to buy them out for four and a half billion dollars, which meant these two young men, pastors in their church and avid supporters of Trump, now had two and a half or two and a quarter billion dollars, not million, but billion dollars to spend. And what, you know, I'm sure they bought jets, and all sorts of things like that, but they went on a mad land buying spree. And they now own about three quarters of a million acres, mainly in the American West. But, and here's the crucial thing, instead of allowing people access, because it has been traditional that most of the more decent landowners in the West, despite what I said earlier, I'm really talking about the mountain West. So Colorado, Montana, Wyoming, Idaho. They would allow people to snowmobile or walk or climb or 
you know, the kind of things that are in, inherent in Rocky Mountain culture. And the Wilkes brothers said, no, we own it now. No one's allowed on it. And um, they put up security gates and they put up closed off forest roads, which are that were hitherto were legally publicly accessible roads through the forests um, and started selling off parcels for development building condos and ski resorts and things so they have a seriously black mark i think but they have a lot of money and a lot of power locally and um, a lot of land but they're not managing it in the way that it's certainly i i don't like to say so but I think it shouldn't be managed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we would definitely. It, it's almost a little too easy to get away with like, treating land that way, uh, and a little too difficult to to do otherwise. In, in I mean, I very much cleave to the the Aboriginal saying. I mean, I'm sure you will know it so well. It becomes almost trite, but you know, the Aboriginal view is the earth is our mother she looks after us we should look after her and i think that's the relationship that one should have to land not to exploit her to the full not to pollute her not to create tracts tract housing and subdivisions great mm -hmm. highways and so forth no treat it more tenderly and I, so I, I i don't know if you're interested in the whole concept of wilding or artificial wilding i I think it's a bit of a stunt, quite honestly. And, but there is this estate south of London, uh, run by a chap called Burrell and his wife, who's called Isabella Tree. And um, they have, they ran a not particularly successful um, arable and dairy farm. And they decided, let's kick out all the milk cows and things and allow it to run wild and reintroduce species of animals and birds and things that existed in the England of 2000 years ago. And it's now, it's been to an extent successful, but it's totally artificial. And um, I, oddly enough, the chap that owns that land in Scotland who did not get into the, um, into the book, he said to me, look, he said, if I look out of this window, which I obviously I can't because it's pitched out, but I'll see old stone walls that were built in the 19th century by Ukrainian immigrants who came up here to raise chickens for the New York City market. It was very hard scrabble farming, but they cleared the land, and pulled the rocks off and built crude chicken sheds and raised chickens. And then eventually they gave up and moved to more congenial parts of the world like New York City. Um, leaving behind their buildings and their stone walls and their cleared fields. And what has happened? The fields have now become wild naturally. There was no need to introduce old animals because they've come back. And so now we have moose, we have coyotes, we have bobcats, we have possums, all sorts of birds, hawks, eagles. So without any effort, simple, the simple fact of humankind having left, and I'm the only one for miles here, it's become wild. And I delight in that fact. So when I get up every morning to walk the dog or allow him to wander over the hills here, I'm slightly worried that he might get eaten by a, picked up by a hawk or eaten by a coyote. But in a way, I'm glad that he lives in a wild rather than an, artif an artificially wild environment. Mm -hmm. I, I actually, I did have a question on the wilding uh, projects. You know, you, you, you had a, you mentioned that poem by uh, Simon Armitage in the, in the chapter. Yes. Yes. Which, um, which was quite, uh, if I could read it real quick, uh, because I have it here. You're going to uh, read it. Are you? Yes. So I'd if, rather if you I, read it with all that. I'd have to look at it and find it in my copy of the book. Right. So yeah. uh, if I breathe the world that disappeared all people in the world, leaving the world to the world, would you say it? Would you sing it out loud? Um, and what do you think about that? I mean, would you? <laughs> like, do you believe that 
the earth would be in a way better off without us kind of uh allow it to well i think one of the books i think i have the book hi when so there's a book isn't there about when we're gone because we will go i mean there's no doubt about that i mean i i was a geologist and i i remember i was at oxford in the 1960s and my tutor a chap called kennedy said there will be no humans left on this planet um, after another 200 years he said i mean that I, I was astonished um and he said no i mean either we'll pollute ourselves or the sea levels will rise this was long before the concept of climate change had attracted anyone other than you know, scientists or we'll there'll be some nuclear disaster and um in a way and if this is no criticism of environmental organizations like yourself or like some organizations anyway I take the very much the, the the love lock view that the earth will look after itself. Maybe it will not be congenial for us and we'll we'll reap what we sow. We will become extinct, but the planet will recover and um, we'll just be a little blip on their geological timeline. A very small blip as it happens. Of course. So no, I won't grieve when we're gone. But on the other hand, just today, 341 local time. This morning, a great nephew was born um, to a relative of mine, a little boy. And I said in my email, I said, well, I'm now 77. So this little child will be, when he's 77 in 2098, what on earth will the world, world look like? It is impossible to imagine. And you, from your point of view, must be very nervous about what it's going to look like. I'll be long dead. But <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I spend enough of my day thinking about these things that <laughs> it, it, it's become second nature to be nervous, <laughs> put it that way. Right, yes. um, but so kind of going off on that, on the topic of, you know, future generations and, you know, younger, you know, our, our children and our, our grandchildren, um, how do we ensure that not only our land management, but also, you know, just our stewardship of the earth and its resources. How do we ensure that uh, our practices keeps those future generations in mind and the needs of those future generations in mind? Well, it's easy for me to talk about that sort of thing because, you know, I'm middle class, I've got a bit of cash in the bank and so forth. And so I can buy organic food and everything. I go to the farmer's market here in my local village and, uh, I know the farmers, I, I help them. I'm part of the supply chain, if you like. I do not, to the extent that it's possible to do so, I do not buy processed food and so forth. But, you know, if you live in a food desert in the South Bronx, then you're going to buy processed food. It's going to be cheap and you're going to bless the fact that there is a McDonald's or whatever down the road. And, um, that's got to change, has it not? Um, mm -hmm. And we must stamp out the McDonald's of the world, but give the people who don't have as much money um, the ability to, to buy food from sustainable sources that uh, within their means to buy it. But I think slowly, the, slowly, 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 the message is getting through. Certainly the current generation, which, you know, so I know many people now, and I'm sure you do too, that don't have driver's licenses anymore, have no interest in driving, um, and are responsible. Go to the farmer's markets they see in Manhattan. And um, so I'm sort of hopeful. But having said all of that, this is the United States I'm talking about. I'm not talking about you know, impoverished communities in South Africa or Vietnam or wherever. And it's, it's going to take a huge effort and the effort of organizations like yourselves, of course, to get the message right, across. Of um, so just um, um, to pivot a little bit, uh, I should do my job and talk about climate change. <laughs> um, so, you know, you kind of, your, your book has been, uh, it, it can kind of be described as a journey through the history of, of land and, and ownership. <laughs> And it's historically mostly been uh, 
not necessarily immutable, not necessarily permanent, but quite unchanging, at least over a single human's lifetime. Um, but now, you know, there's this, there's this threat, as you said, of, of sea level rise or just of um, extreme weather events or extreme temperatures making land uninhabitable or un, un, unprofitable and fruitful. Uh, so under these kind of these, these changing circumstances that are happening very quickly, how do you see, uh, how do you see people coping with uh, their land suddenly becoming uh, very different from what it was when they were born? Yeah, well, I mean, that's uh, fascinating because of, and horrifying because of the speed. I mean, all of you obviously be familiar with the situation in places like Bangladesh and in countries like Kiribati in the Pacific, where people who you know, 10 years ago imagined that they could live on this island or this atoll can't anymore. And so the New Zealanders very cleverly have said to the people of Kiribati, I think, we, you, you can be regarded as climate refugees because Mm -hmm. Several of your atolls are now or are shortly to be uninhabitable. But every day there are warnings and things one can see here. I mean, I'm at 1500 feet, so I'm in zone five, I think, for growing things. But it is significantly warmer than when I came here 20 years ago. I mean, I'm growing on my patio now a lemon tree. I mean, lemon trees don't grow in New England, mm -hmm. normally anyway. And yet, because the average temperatures are going up and the amount of rainfall this year has been prodigious. I, we have a very, very good weather forecaster on the radio here. And he said that uh, just this morning, I heard him before I went down to the city, 10.6 inches more rain has fallen this year already than did last year. These kind of figures are shocking. The average temperature going up, you know, Ten years ago, you would read the, you know, the, whatever that panel is called on climate change, and you would read things which would say, you know, by the end of the century, the temperature will have gone up you know, five eighths of a Fahrenheit degree or something. And you think, ah, oh, too far to be concerned about. It. But it's not. It's going up as we watch almost, and then we read about pivotal moments. I mean, I used to do a lot of exploring in East Greenland when I was uh, a youngster. And then I mean, it was, we were locked in the ice. We were, you'll hate me for saying this, but we were marooned for several days. And, and this is 1965. In order to survive, I shot and we ate a polar bear. I mean, it's a terrible thing to admit, but we had to, because otherwise we would have died. And a very old bear, anyway, just why I was able to shoot him. Um, but nowadays, the place where we got locked into the ice, it's ice free all the time now. In southern Greenland, the tip, Cape Farewell, little towns like Angmaslik, um, they grow potatoes and there are trees starting to grow, small saplings. So before your eyes, you can see these things. And the Great Barrier Reef in Australia dying because of the increased um, acidity of the water and the increased temperature. So this is not something happening in the distance, it's happening now. And even the most obtuse people, I think, can see it. We are reaching tipping points, all to do, as you well know, with the albedo, the reflectivity of the polar ice caps. The moment that starts becoming gray, then more and more radiation will pour, pour in from the from the sun and it'll just then accelerate exponentially. And I think that'll happen probably not in my lifetime, but certainly in yours, I think, unless we do something. Right. But do it very quickly. Right. The, um, I mean, uh, of course, you know, I, I think about this stuff for myself, but, you know, as you, as you mentioned before, uh, you know, we're very familiar with the, um, the, the crisis basically facing countries like the Maldives, uh, Bangladesh, Marshall Islands, Kiribati, uh, who could lose their land within decades. And that is, you know, obviously it's tragic because these are you know, obviously indigenous people who their entire history is, is tied to this land. How do you see 
that, um, how do you see kind of that historical cultural identity uh, in these places persevering, even if the land is lost? Do you have much hope? Well, I mean, it, 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 it won't. Uh, I mean, the, Mold well, the Moldives, in any case, has, has lost a lot of its own cultural identity in recent years because of the huge influx of tourism. This is not true of Tuvalu and Kiribati and many of the, the sort of more remote parts of the Polynesia, but uh, I did a long piece some years ago on the Hokulea, which is this Hawaiian boat, which a uh, huge ocean going canoe, which was built by the Hawaiians on Oahu as a gift to the United States for the bicentenary in 1976. And um, they wanted to see if they could navigate it using the old Polynesian techniques, um, using no compasses, no clocks, no nothing. And there was only one man, a chap called Mao Piaoluk, who lived in the Caroline Islands. And they went and found him and he said, yes, I can, I can navigate your canoe for you. And so they flew him up to Honolulu, he'd never been on a plane before, and showed him the boat. And he said, yeah, I can do that. And so everyone that crewed, because it was a big vehicle, a big vessel, there were about 20 youngsters. And he navigated it using only looking at the flights of seagulls, feeling the swell of the sea, looking at the stars, but not through a telescope, just looking at them. And he said, after about nine days, I think, heading south, they said, somewhat nervously, where are we? And he said, well, you should see the lights of Papiete and Tahiti tomorrow morning at about 4 a.m. And sure enough, on the button, he got there. And so there's been this fascination among young Hawaiian peoples to learn the ways of the old Polynesian peoples. And uh, people I think you should possibly talk to unless you have already. And they're wonderful and remarkable. And they, they then took the um, Hokulea, the boat, completely around the world two years ago. Once again, using no instruments at all. And they made it and um, safely and it taught a new generation of Hawaiians the ways of the old Polynesians. Mao Pialuk didn't survive, so but a, a new gang are now learning. In a, and they all, I'm sure, in normal circumstances would have their Xboxes and iPads and all the rest of it. They didn't take any of them on the joint voyage, but they came back knowing something enormously valuable. Hmm. That's, uh, that's quite inspiring. <laughs> Uh, and quite, quite, quite encouraging, even for it is to go. Um, I mean, for for future generations, for for young people now, it's um, uh, yeah. The hope is that you know we can leave them with 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 ideally better than what we had. Um, at best, the same, <laughs> or at best, uh, an equal playing field. Um, but do you see kind of their um, perspectives on land ownership, on uh, extractive kind of, you know, uh, lifestyles. Uh, do you see that changing with the uh, kind of young generations now um, and future generations? Well, I, as I've sort of indicated earlier, I tend to be very optimistic when I meet bright-eyed youngsters in Brooklyn or up here in New England, and they tell me about their projects and to save the earth. I think they could. This is if these people are listened to, this would be great. And then I was in suburban New Jersey recently and talking to a bunch of 16 and 17 year olds, and they have no clue about anything. They don't care. They're just put on this earth to consume. In the case of the girls, it would be fashion. In the case of the boys, it would be video games. And I know that's an awful cliche to say that. So yes, I am occasionally hopeful, but then, and I know this is an awful cliche, without education and awareness pervading particularly the suburbs in this country, where life is very easy in so many ways, um, then I don't see as much hope. 
but we can but try. Of course. Uh, I mean, one one last question, wrapping up. Uh, what would you like readers to take away from your book, if uh, especially younger readers and kind of uh, leaders of the future? What is one piece of advice or knowledge? Well, it's funny. I, most of the people that when I give the book has been out since uh, since January and sold very well, had very nice reviews. But the readers do tend to be older people. Mm -hmm. And that troubles me because I would much rather youngsters. Um, but I think there are all manner of inspiring stories. I think the Hokulea story, which is a story which was in an earlier book of mine on the Pacific Ocean, should be inspiring. I think you mentioned the Scottish islands and uh, the way that they're being repopulated by incomers who are all pitching in to help. A lot of those are young people. So I think those stories people might be somewhat stimulated by. Um, but, you know, I'm just, what do people want to go away and read? And generally, unfortunately, they want body stripping novels or detective stories or preferably no books at all. And that, that troubles me. But I think there's enough in this book that I get a lot of letters from people who are fairly turned on by it. And, uh, I'd like them to be younger people. So it's a fairly sort of woolly answer to your question, but uh, and the next book I'm writing is on the history of the dissemination of knowledge. And um, I think I'll find equally troubling questions there. Mm -hmm. Because if we have no knowledge, then we have no wisdom. If we have no wisdom, then we certainly don't look after the world as it should be looked after. That sounds like a very interesting topic to explore. Will, will it involve a lot of traveling as well? Well, interestingly, I know. I mean, I'm going to London on the 9th of October. I'm going to Bangalore and I'm going to Shanghai. Um, this all depends on borders being open and so forth. Uh, Japan, my wife is Japanese American, and uh, but we can't go. I mean, the Japanese have suspended all entry permits for, for most people. But you know, the delta curve is going down at last. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, yeah, I don't know what it's doing over there, but it's, um, I think by the end of the year, I should be able to, but my deadline is the end of June to deliver it, and um, I will, but uh, but I equally, I'm, I'm, it's my birthday on Tuesday, and I should be 77, and I'm not nearly as keen to travel as I used to be. I love where I live, I love this land, mm -hmm. and I'm opening a little bookstore here, and I think the idea of spending my declining years running a bookstore is quite an interesting thing to do. That sounds quite idyllic. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we look we look forward to reading your, your new book <laughs> when it comes out. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's a great note to end it on. Uh, thank you very much for your time, Simon. Uh, this was a, a great talk. Uh, we look forward to seeing what you come out with in future. Thank you. I look forward to it.